All right. Morning, guys. It's Monday again. Um, hope Ready? everybody survived the weekend. Um, today we're going to be talking about a classic film that I like um, with Gene Hackman. I I'm a big Gene Hackman fan. First of all, he's a veteran of the United States military, served in the U.S. Marine Corps in the 1950s. He would uh, eventually move to New York where he was a doorman and ran into one of his officers when he was a doorman. And um, it led to an awkward situation because he was one of those guys that was always in trouble as a soldier. And, uh, <clears throat> oh, you need to see it, D-Bud. It's, it's, it's a great film. Look, it, no matter what movie it is, if Gene Hackman's in it, it's worth a watch. But this is actually a great film that plays on the classic conspiracy theory around uh, John F. Kennedy. In fact, it's brought up in the film. And uh, and I, I really do like the way Tommy Lee Jones and Gene Hackman work together. They have, they have real chemistry, and they're only in a few scenes together uh, at the beginning of the film and uh, towards the end of the movie. So, but anyway, uh, it's one of my favorites um, as far as that kind of premise goes. So, yeah. So, uh, he, he, Jin, I, I mean, Jin Hagman, in real life, is, is like his character. <laughs> A good soldier that had some serious impasses with superior officers. Yeah, because he's he's near the uh, what you would refer to. This is clearly a guy who's been in for twenty, maybe twenty plus years. Twenty five, he says. <laughs> yeah, and and he's reached the rank of uh, first sergeant, and um, and that's it. So this is a guy who's probably not going to go any higher. Has no aspirations to. So good morning, Andy. Um, I should mention that uh, David Pfaff is uh, has become a YouTube member. It's really wonderful. Uh, I know that during um, our live stream this weekend that I did with uh, wait, who was I hanging out with? Because I know Tom was there. The salty notes. Was that okay? The salty nerds this weekend. Boy, that was fun. I really had a good time. I'd like to do that again. I like hanging out with Matt Vader. He's he's just one of my besties. And uh and we talk shit about a lot of things. Had a good time. And I noticed during the thing somebody uh got a new membership and um became and bought five memberships for others uh on that show. This young lady, and I'm like, holy crap. You know, that was really nice. I didn't expect anything like that because we were kind of co-streaming, you know, to our channel. And I was like, oh, there are people in our chat, like talking. We had almost 20 And I people. always want to make sure to let them know that uh, this is not our stream. We're being allowed to restream. This is Salty Nerds show. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't want to interrupt the proceedings. But that really excited me, and it was really nice that um, uh, one of the members of the Salty Nerds actually like commented on it. That was really nice. I'm like, yeah, it's really fucking nice. I thanked them in the chat, but uh, I think it was Matt that said something about it, and I'm like, yeah, it's really fucking nice they did that. So um, thank you all. We have a great audience, and we share our audience. You guys watch all the shows that we watch. I watch and, and get to hang out with. Because I know D-Bud Martin in particular. I see him all the time in any other shows, like with Nick, who's absolutely one of my favorite people to hang out with. We had no show last week, but we do have a show this week. And I forget what movie we're doing this week. Do you know, do you know the miniseries? No. I'm talking about Nick on oh, Toxic oh, Tuesday. Sorry. I, I, I forget we what we're doing. I we're talking about our Saturday. Because no, I'm yeah, talking about yeah, Tuesday. Sure yeah, Nick is just... Uh, there are two people that I uh, enjoy breaking on a show. 
Keith and Nick, because I will say something that will just shut him down for a moment. And it tickles me that he's a lot like Keith, that I can do that and break him uh, during a show. Like when I, when I did that unexpected little gag the first time back on the show after I had to take a break for a while because I was out in the living room and, and I don't want to wake people up so I couldn't do the show. And um, he, hit, he puts the camera on me and, and uh, turns it on. And I'm sitting there reading a pie and cake uh, Southern Kitchen magazine. And he says, oh, and there's Gary reading a, a some sort of pie and cake baking magazine. And I looked up like I wasn't expecting him. And I said, uh, oh, hey, yeah, I was trying to uh, catch up on some stuff. But apparently, I've been doing cream pies all wrong. And that broke. That broke Nick. <laughs> For like a minute. Uh, you guys are doing Police Academy this week. Oh, yeah. I love that one. What kind of clown do you take me for? <laughs> one of my favorite lines yeah but nick's the shit i i fucking love nick i like hanging out with him and the gang so there we are um it says we got nine folks in here right now um wait a few more minutes uh, to see if everybody's got their coffee and gets going here before we start the, the show but um uh the film is directed, in, by the way, by Andrew Davis, and uh, he's known for films like, well, number one, The Fugitive is one of his biggest things. He did the film Under Siege, which is probably the single only really good Steven Seagal movie ever made. Uh, he directed The Guardian with uh, Kevin Costner and, and um, Ashton Kutcher, which is a really good film. I do like that film. And, you know, there's this really, really weird movie that he did uh, at the beginning of Shia LaBeouf's career called Holes, which is actually a good film. If you've never seen it, you should see it. It's a fun little film. Sigourney Weaver's in it. Uh, they had a good cast. Um, let's see. What else did he direct? Let me look down here. Uh, let's see. Oh, he did that really weird Arnold Schwarzenegger film before he became governor. Collateral Damage. Uh, oh, another good film he did, A Perfect Murder with Michael Douglas. A film that kind of didn't get... It's not a bad film, but it's not a great film with Keanu Reeves and Morgan Freeman, Chain Reaction. Oh, yeah. Nah, that's a bad it's movie. not a great film. But then again, I want to point out the other only really good Steven Seagal film was his first film, Above the Law, directed by Dave, you know, Davis too. Chuck Norris film that I really like called Code of Silence. And then uh, really before that, I, I don't know if anything's really worth mentioning because it's all small stuff. We have Sax in the house. Hey, Sax. And for him. Hey, fuck you, Kyle. <laughs> and we all hope that you're feeling better and got, that you're getting better. He directed the um, OnStar commercials, OnStar Batman. What? He worked with Tim Burton and Joel Schumacher in making those commercials. Did you not see them? Oh, we don't have OnStar in Venezuela. Well, by the time. I need to... I don't know if I can play the, the videos... But I should, I should um, show the video because if, if you've never seen it, they're really good. They were they were worth a chuckle. On I don't Batman. think I ever seen a, an, an All Star commercial ever. Yeah, I got to be careful because there's musical cues that we might get called for. Uh, I'll delete it later.
Good evening, Batman. Alfred. I've stepped up safety in the Batmobile, sir. Really? Should a villain steal it, someone will track it. If your airbag goes off, an advisor will assist you. If you're stranded, satellites will help locate you. And where have you put all these things? Just press the OnStar button, sir. Well done, Alfred. My pleasure, sir. OnStar, how can I help you, Batman? And it's just one of them. There's a whole slew of them. Yeah. I one just... with the Joker. Boy from I got a signal your airbag went off. Should I send for an ambulance? Everything's fine. Send the police to Fort and Maine. I'll contact him right away. There you go. Back when Who's Marcus that used guy? to be good. Who's Batman? Uh, just some actor. I don't know who that was. I could. Hey, Dragon I... Ruse in the house. I, is it really? Or is it a ruse? Maybe. You never know. Bruce Thomas is the actor who played him. Hmm. This is him. He had the look down. I'll give you that. Almost looked a little bit like Bruce Campbell here. <laughs> And he's worked in other Batman. He was in... Some, oh, that's oh, why... Lord. Look at that. He played Mini Ash. Oh! In Army of Darkness. I make that comment that he looks kind of like Bruce Campbell. And there you go. And he played Gordon and Ubu in Son of Batman. He's in other DC stuff, too. There you go. So... That's kind of cool. But anyway, back to the package. Well, so that's what she said. Andrew Davis was the director, uh, and it stars Gene Hackman, Tommy Lee Jones, and Joanna Cassidy, who is somebody I know. Um, she's a real nice lady. Um, it also has uh, John Hurd playing a villain, and uh, Hurd is is you know somebody who died young. Hmm. Uh, he was making uh, the series um, The Sopranos, and he died during it. And I can't remember. What did he pass away from? Heart. Wasn't it a, a heart attack? I can't remember. Yep, heart attack. I remember because he 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 plays or used to play the, the father of um, the character Bones in the to that series, Bones. Oh, on and, show Bones. Yeah, and the the my daughters and my wife they they are big big fans of that show, and so that took them by surprise. Uh, it had another good character actor. He's always always plays cops. Is Ron Dean, but Dennis Franz is a real highlight of this movie. Uh, this is uh, like really early in his career. And uh, it helped give him a little bit more of a kick into the television. Uh, even though he's been a film actor. I mean, he's in the movie. Um, what was it? Um, it was a remake of the German film about an angel who falls to earth. And it was Nicolas Cage and Meg Ryan. Uh, City of Angels. Yeah, City of Angels. He's in that. He plays a, a previously fallen angel that smells and senses Nick Cage in the room. And really good. I'm trying to see other actors that were in there that are good character actors. Well, Pam Greer. Greer had a small part in it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's another actor who plays one of the generals who was also in a few other Andrew Davis films. He's in Above the Law. Above the Law. And uh, I cannot find him here. But he was in a lot of, uh, there he is. Yeah, Chelsea Ross. And uh, I guess he's still going. It doesn't show that he's passed away, but he must be up there in age. He was in all of Andrew Davis's films. Plus, he was in some other films like Basic Instinct, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, Hoosiers, Major League. He played one of the ballplayers, the older ballplayer that's on the team. 
it's always not given his best. Um, NCIS scandal. Uh, he's just one of those actors that when you see him, you just recognize him, but you never know his names. You never, because <laughs> he's not famous, but he's in a lot of great movies and TV shows. But I really like the package for its cast and uh, what she said. The writing in it was really good. It was written by uh, John Bishop, uh, who is, you know, he wrote only a handful of films. I think he worked on Drop Zone with uh, Wesley Snipes, and he worked on a comedy show. That's all he ever did. I'm like, this Man. guy's a really good writer. Man, I got to tell you, the, the actor that they got for playing Gorbachev <laughs> The spitting image of the man. <laughs> yeah, except he didn't have the splotch on his head, did he? I don't yeah. remember. No, no, did he? he didn't. No, have he it. didn't. No. But otherwise, <laughs> he looked the part really, really good. And hello, Penny. Good morning, Penny. I don't know if she was there, but we were saying hi to her at near the end of the show on on Salty Nerds the other day. Dude, show me one show where Penny isn't in the chat. Yeah, I know. Good luck with that. It's like she's, you know, she's connected in with our community, man. I'm probably late to be to the party in saying, of course, Gary loves the package. I, you look, the bigger the package, the better. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I embrace gay humor <laughs> at my own expense. Only humor. And um, yeah, actual humor, not. Like that, what you just did. So, Joanna Cassidy is in it. She plays um, Gene Hackman's ex in it. And she's just one of those, those actresses that just really owns a part. And I don't know how much prep she did for this role because uh, I don't think she put much prep into it. She's just a good actor, just walks in, does the lines. And uh, she gets into the action, though, which is my, one of my favorite scenes in the film, is the, the scene in the garage where um, Holy shit, these guys so are, are um, coming up to her saying that they're with the police department. She, she smells them. She's like, no, you're not. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. And they don't expect her to fight back. They get their asses handed. Yep. She uh, knocks the shit out of them with her... Her handbag. That's not a purse. That's a fucking handbag. She yeah. <laughs> Probably for that reason. That could be a weapon. You know, simple as here. Hello, my friend. Yeah. Hey, Dustin. Uh, I've missed you, Gary. You've been so busy. Yeah, you've been busy. You've been doing a lot lately. So. Good morning to everybody. We got 19 in the house. I think it's time to start. Yeah. Get us into this mode here. No, no. Maybe this mode. Yeah. A little better. I really like the way Nick is doing it with half the panel on the left side and the other half on the right side, but it makes no sense for only three people. Yeah, well, this is really odd. I'm going to do it this way. There we go. And to update the layout because it had us all the way to the left and I'd rather have us centered because I'm OCD. Okay, Kido sends you a photo on Twitter. Uh oh. Oh, is that Rocket Kitty starting the engines? Yes, yes, of course. I am on my Twitter account. I've not seen anything from you. Did you send it through Pop Cultures? Go there. Super pumped Russian. 
Yeah, you sent it to the pop culture account. Now that's a big cock. Oh my god. I knew it. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's really a big cock. There you go. <sighs> that thing's at least five feet tall. Makes me think of Peter Griffin. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, please, Kiro, stop doing it, Ramo. That looks like it was at, um, uh, what is that Christian owned hobby store? Hobby Lobby. And that's something you just don't think of happening at a Hobby Lobby, finding a big cock. Uh, it would be nice to see a, a green symbol in monetization sometime. Dream on, Mati. Dream on. Okay, so... Uh, for people like you, Diva, that hasn't seen this movie. The, be the beginning are negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union to begin the process of nuclear disarmament. Disarmament, peace in our time. And yeah, there's right. an element in both governments that would like to see that not happen. So and this is they Star Trek. decide to work together. This is Star Trek, the undiscovered country. Yeah. Well, they copied this one. This this came out first. And that actor, man, the, the guy who's at the, the, the black guy, mm -hmm. he he's the one in the in the the the, the blacklist is the one showed. He was too young. Hey Courtney, good to see you. Oh, well. <laughs> Gary, you have to read this. Oh, darn. You're live and I can't stay. Popping in to say hi and much love, everyone. I live near a Hobby Lobby, FYI, and there are huge packages there all the time. There you go. Thank you, Court. Sorry you can't stick around. Yeah, and that there's this general that he was. It's a general. Yes, yeah, a general. He was in in the conspiracy, but at the at the last moment, he says, "No, no, 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 no. I can I can go with this." And that was the guy that we saw walking. Yep. Alone. And this is the actor you're talking about, Harry yes. Lennox, a very well known actor, and he had a bit part in this movie as one of the soldiers on his team. Here, the the short one. He's the one who says the tall one is the not. actor I was talking about that everybody notices but never remembers his name. Yeah. In this case, is General Sleesbag. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of a butt sniffer. See you later, Court. Bye, Courtney. Have a nice day. Thanks a lot, Court. Appreciate it. Now, there's another great black actor in here from Star Trek. Uh, is Thalmas Rasulia, uh, Rasulila. And um, 
He died way back in the 90s, man. Um, dead in 93, I think. Let me look and see. He was in New Jack City. 91. He died in 91. He was in New Jack City, above the law roots. He'd been a, a Star Trek admiral. It was uh, Star Trek Next Generation episode Contagion. Oh, so he and was he plays an admiral. Of... What? He was one of the admirals that was being controlled by the aliens. Yep. He was the black guy, mm. the black admiral. Oh, easy way to man. pick him out. This scene, police. <laughs> so the it's it's curious how I I could understand what the Germans were, were talking. Maybe because they were real Germans. I mean, German-speaking people. And not just Americans learning German words. Yeah, there, there, are, there, are, movies. there are so many similarities between Ger German and English. It's like Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, I wouldn't say they're that close. Well, Spanish and they, French. They used really simple phrases too. Mm. To make it easy to pick up what's going on. In fact, Anna yeah, pointed out that the German officer, police officers, said something that somebody that was German wouldn't say or said it in a they way. They use weird German. words sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> the phrasing was off a little bit, but it was okay. What did he say? We're not better than anyone? <laughs> no, just saying things in a way that you wouldn't say in German. Now, this so guy is an actual good. reporter, by the way, in real yes. life. Ike Papas. It's so cool that they used to be a reporter. TV journalist. Now, I will I like say this. I don't know if those were Russian actors playing the Russians, but they all looked Russian. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> I like all, all the generals and staffers and everybody. Everybody's looking at everybody else with, I want to kill you. <laughs> and the, the discomfort in this scene with the, the Russians and the Americans in this room together, the, this is the conspiratorial group that are doing what's about to happen. Destiny's Captain, what's up? We're talking about the movie The Package with Gene Hackman and Tommy Lee Jones. I bet you, I bet <laughs> And here's when some things begin hey, to the converge. Cops let them Look. go. What's yeah. up with that? They are so totally they, just going for a hike. Yeah, not they, suspicious they, at all. The cops that never check the check off their their backpacks. Well, clearly they weren't real cops. <laughs> well, Gene, Gene just let them go. Church. They're part of the conspiracy. <clears throat> By the way, that patch on his shoulder, he is 3rd Armor Division. It's a classic film, dude. Always worth a watch. Tommy Lee Jones and Gene Hackman, man. You don't get much better than that. So in firing these shots, it draws the attention of our team of soldiers. So they end up in a firefight, and one of their guys gets killed. And uh, they nail the male killer. He gets hit, but he still escapes. 
damn patriarchy. It's a pretty brutal scene. And that's what they yell, yeah, top, because that's what we call our first sergeant's top. It's a common nickname for first sergeants. Hmm. That one, I didn't know. We've heard it in many movies that we discussed before. Plus, when I tell some of my stories, like when I'm in formation and the first sergeant called me a pacifist. Yeah, you use it too. I said it there. I said, hey, Top, I'm not a pacifist. I'm a conscientious objector. What's the difference? Well, I will tell you. <laughs> he was very enlightened after that conversation. Single best acting in this scene is the stenographer. <laughs> what? I think I'm just being an ass. <laughs> You really believed her th that she was a stenographer so much so you don't even notice she's in the scene <laughs> that there's a stenographer. I noticed. Mm. Especially now, her... when... No, go ahead. When she looks at the colonel with uh, with that look of, should I go? <laughs> Do you want this type down? Do you really? want me to type what's being said here? <laughs> you really want shorthand on this? Because that's what they do. They type in shorthand. Now, John Hurt here is really good. <laughs> in this scene he has a stony cold look that you i've met guys like this in the military and i get a bad vibe on guys like this um and the reason why is he's got the uniform on but he has no honor this is not a man of honor this is a, a man who is all about government he's he works as a spook within the military does a lot of co-op with nsa and cia and um, he's the, you can't trust people like this. And he is trying to put the blame on Gene Hackman and his team for what happened. He says, you let them go? I turned them over to police. And he, he already knows that they weren't real cops. So he's like, um, throws that on him too. When he was told by the talk to let him go, release him. Talk says cops are there. Yeah. And, you know, my response to this guy was, you know, they they showed ID. The ID looked legit. So fuck off. Now, Marine Corps makes fun of the U.S. Army because you'll see these guys with a lot of ribbons on their chest. And they said Army is like. One of the, and it's true, the army is like the worst for ribbons. They will give you a ribbon for tying your shoes correctly. Like every time you turn around, they're offering ribbons. I have ribbons and I'm like, I really didn't do anything. <laughs> I still got a, a few ribbons on my chest. But at least one of those ribbons is for not getting in trouble for all the yeah. stuff you did. Served with honor and distinction during a time of war. So I get that that national service ribbon. I should say got that past tense. I think he fucked up, Colonel. He's still playing a part here because... The guy he's talking to isn't part of the conspiracy. And here we meet this kid who got arrested and is uh, being picked up by the military. He's arrested by the German police. Who still wear uniforms, in my opinion, that make them look like Gestapo. Do we know why he's been arrested? I yes. Yeah. That. At this point, no, because I at this point we he was wearing he shouldn't have been. He was with a, a East German woman, and he got oh, arrested. Okay and is being released now into the care of this officer and clearly he's part of this he believes that he is part of this plan he says we need you to do these things and um and he's all for it yes sir gonna do it 
No, 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 no. They they lied to him. They they I'm not telling the audience that right now. No. That's see, you just let the cat out of the bag that he's a dupe. That he's a, a what do they call that? A stooge, a, a patsy. He's the Lee Harvey Oswald of this story. In fact, there's a hint of that with the fact that he's laying with a communist woman. Because you didn't know Lee Harvey was involved with a communist woman. <clears throat> and now this guy is using his name, Tommy Lee Jones. I'm immediately like, wait, he's, he's, he has the same last name as the last character, Hinky? That's weird. I'm like, oh, wait, no, he's pretending to be Hinky. And even his name, Hinky. It's a term for when things seem not normal. We use that. In, in fact, Tommy Lee Jones is in the movie where it got used another time is uh, The Fugitive, directed by Andrew Davis. And one of his guys go tells him, oh, that's a little hinky. It's spelled differently, but it's said pretty much the same. There's the strata carrier. And he begins kind of pushing buttons with Gene Hackman's character who just sort of takes his comments in stride. You're going to be in trouble. Is, you know, his response to him. How many times you've been busted? I don't know. How long you figure before you're back in the shit someplace, Johnny? Philippines, Mexico, maybe. That's what I signed up to do, right? You're a patriotic individual. You're a merc for the country and you're born in, you know it. <clears throat> the definition of merc, by the way, what he's talking about, is somebody who um, conscripts to serve in the military for a country to fight for them and gets paid. If you're conscripted and being paid, technically you're called a mercenary. And that's what he's going for there. And when he died, he had to borrow the money to bear him. Yeah, this. Uh, and you begin to wonder how many of these stories he told him is bullshit. Just part of the character. I don't know. He, he looks like a, a man that started his military career believing and became jaded. Mm -hmm. Well, you. clearly. Yeah, you better wear those ribs and cut your hair and shape up. Yeah, his hair is so long. How was that even allowed? Uh, if he's permanent party, you can get away with a lot of stuff, permanent party. You only have to shape up during inspection. And he's been in jail, and you don't know how long he's been in jail, too. So, got a quarter? Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> and of course on his shoulder uh gene hackman's is um he's got the uh Air special ranger. forces and ranger stuff on there including oh. he's got ranger um above the patch And you can tell from the get go the way they're all yes. looking at each other. This is a planned thing. He's Army Airborne Ranger himself. That's well, the real guy. It's 82nd. <laughs> He's 82nd Airborne. 
hey, you're not the same black guy I met before. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Gene Hackman gets knocked out. Uh, now, I'm going to point something out we didn't get here in, in the um, slides, is that when the guy saps him in the back of the head to knock him out, he goes to hit him a second time, and that would probably kill him. And Tommy Lee Jones stops him from doing it. Showing that for some reason he actually took a shine to this soldier. Or that's not part of the plan. You don't know with a character like Tommy Lee Jones. Was it because he took a shine to him or what? I think he did. And clearly, if you look at Tommy Lee Jones' uniform, he had how many? I counted them. Nine deployments. Nine, nine deployments. deployments. He had more deployments than Gene Hackman's character. And you tend to become kind of jaded, as well as probably a war junkie, too. Yeah. I mean, we counted them. I was like, holy shit, that's a lot of deployments. And I'm it's not going to get into how they're wearing their berets because it's just, <laughs> just don't. It's a movie. Yep. Some things you just got to let go. I will say that Gene wears his better than Tommy did. Oh my God, this woman is tiny. And that's a Green Beret patch, by the way. As well as the Ranger. A lot of fucking ribbons on that guy, including even on his left breast. So you would think somebody with that many ribbons would have a higher rank than he's got. He never cared for ranking up. Yeah, he's, well, my he's guess is he probably got into trouble. Yeah, they say that, that when... Yeah. Yeah. Joanna says that to him. What did you do this time? Did you do this? Yes. this or maybe did you do that? Yeah, who did you piss off? <laughs> yeah. Airborne because Rangers he... wear their boots that way. You see that the way his uh, pants are not hanging over the boots. They're tucked in. Only Rangers do that. <clears throat> you have to be Ranger or Airborne. Because those are jump boots. And that's why they wear them that way, to show that they're wearing jump boots. There she is. God, she's gorgeous. She really is. Famously known as Zora from Blade Runner. Now, she is a lieutenant colonel, right? Yeah. She, she just got promoted, yeah. She, yeah, she moves up in rank because she does her job. Yeah, but the thing is, she's an officer. He is not. Yeah. They can they be a couple if they, they are, are not in anymore the same, in the same branch? Wait, at some point they were. They you you don't know where uh, where in time. You don't know. They were they probably the same divorce. Rank. They can't because he's not he didn't study for uh, for an officer and she did. Yeah, but we don't know how long it's been that they aren't together anymore. And I'm guessing when they were together, they were both at the same rank and she moved on and he did his stuff. They can't be the same rank ever. Well, I'm just gonna tell you uh that in the military they frown on dating, it's not allowed. Uh, but if you are married, it's okay. It's one place where they won't, you know, do shit to you. Oh, that uh, one I didn't know. Pam was so here, young. I'll, hold on, let me look it up real quick. Um, here we go. <clears throat> Dating, sharing, living accommodations, and intimate or sexual relationships between an officer and enlisted or NCOs and junior enlisted soldiers is prohibited 
The exceptions are marriage between an officer and an enlisted NCO. U.S. Army. Okay. So they have to date in secret and then, then get married. <laughs> that or if they were already married. Possible. It's like sort of like, I think it's how like um, Anglican priests convert to Catholicism. They're already married. Get to keep their spouse if they become a Catholic priest. The fuck? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, and I'm like sitting there. I made a joke about it once. I said, imagine like working at a parish with a priest who gets to have a wife while you're sitting there not allowed to <laughs> as a priest. It's like You can hear him fucking in the next room in, in the parish. It's like, that would be really fucking awkward. <laughs> the young priest looks at me and goes, you have no idea. <laughs> yeah, but how often does that conversion happen? <laughs> It's it, it's not as rare as you'd think. Uh, Anglican priests convert over um, all the time. And there are Catholic priests who convert over to uh, Anglican so they can get some pussy. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you this. Whoever put his uniform did it right. He's a Marine. He wouldn't know shit about all those ribbons. I love how they still like each other as persons. Yeah, they are friendly until he starts asking questions about her sex life. Then that's when she gets like... But, 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 but he's that's just... Nanya. Yeah, but Nanya he's business. just fucking with her and she knows it. Because you, you can see when, when the conversation is, is, is getting... On and on, she she started smiling like ah, I know what you're doing. Yeah, she <laughs> smiles. Yeah, I caught that too. So Joanna and he have great chemistry. I would have liked to have seen them in another movie together. He did a, another film, uh, a remake of a classic uh, noir film called Narrow Margin with Ann Archer, and man, they had chemistry. Him and redheads. <laughs> hey, Stephen. And he does the proper salute. I like that about him, too. He learned how to salute correctly as a Marine. The one that gets me is when you see guys with their thumb out when they go to salute. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? If you want to do a good salute, learn how to do a knife hand. And that's how you salute. Question. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, uh, Jing's character... He's giving the business to one of his troops because he, he has a, a candy. Yeah. Is, is that real? Yeah. They do Let that? me tell you something. If you if you uh if you've got food in your cargo pockets, the meanest thing I've ever seen done was uh a guy had um um a Ziploc bag of, of some food in his pocket. And uh, senior NCO found out about it, walked up to him, and he goes, "Hey, you, you your uh, cargo pockets look kind of full. What's in there?" He started squeezing them. <laughs> what the heck is in there? It feels soft. And he just had to stay there, stand there, and just take it. Yeah, his his uniform had fucking he stank later. <laughs> <laughs> he stank. <laughs> Because he wasn't allowed to go back and change. We went out there and on a field exercise. Yeah, you get caught with food in your uniform when you're out there on, you know, on mission. They'll kick your fucking ass. Why? Because you're not supposed to have food on you. Yes, but, but why? What's the reason? One is um, it's not part of your uniform. It's not part of your gear. Two, uh, it can attract insects and also give away your position. If it's food, it'll give a smell. Didn't you, you always have food it? on you as a medic? I did. But everything I had was canned. 
I, I made sure to make sure anything I brought with me as a medic um, was canned. I always carried Vienna, Vienna sausages. And it wasn't for me. It was for the other guys. If they started getting a little weak need, hey, man, eat this. you feel better. Costume. Catching up on double speed. <laughs> the leader just like speeding up so we can get caught up to us now. It's what Penny is doing often. <clears throat> she's always telling us when she's dropping out of warp speed. And Destiny Captain tends to do that too. <laughs> yeah. I do it all the time when I uh, like when I'm Midnight's Edge in particular. If I want to know what's going on, I will like go back to the beginning of a show and play it at two or three. I've gone up as much as five times speed because I can still understand oh, people. No, at five. no, no, that's crazy. I, I, I can do more than 175. Yeah, well, that's about my limit, too. Because, uh, oh, uh, double, most... I've gone absolutely double with some people because if they speak slowly. Yes. Uh, it yeah, almost sounds normal. That, that guy was... that we watched yesterday, Jesus. That was unbearable until you sped it up. Yeah, the guy that does all the TV and movie history stuff uh, is a good old boy. He sounds like he's from Oklahoma. And I double speed him, and, and he sounds normal at double speed. Because he's got a real long way of talking. Oh, look at hey, what's those up, monkey Jeebus? fabulous computers. Look at those old computers. <laughs> they look like shit. The little tiny five, seven inch monitor. <laughs> and you, like when you we worked on those, like, man, look at the size of that monitor, man. That's huge. I sit I here now, I've got a 22 inch uh, uh, tablet monitor that I use for my work. And this one that I'm looking at right now is 17 inch. Yeah, I can't go back to that. I need a 22 inch screen because my eyes. It's so just, small. Like you'll see me every once in a while, like doing this shit because mm. I have trouble on the screen seeing the words at the squint with my glasses on to read what is being said. Oh, here comes this. Sad, sad part. Because uh, at this point, Jean, you yeah, had my know he has been doing due. her job investigating. And she got the name of the, the real name of Tommy Lee Jones' character. And she knows they're, they're she's, she's in danger. And she calls uh jean's ex-wife she's an engineer we, by the way yeah so we, we have to meet in secret and don't talk to anybody and just minutes before the well she's being spied on someone must have listened yeah. to that call mm. because they knew where she was going to be Yeah, the, the pen on her lapel is an engineering pen for the U.S. Army, U.S. Army engineers. Ah, <clears throat> uh, yes, and he's been detained in, for investigation concerning the death of the, the wife Inky's wife. Who they murdered. Mm -hmm. They strangled her ass. Oh, I thought they strangled her neck, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to respond minor, to that. Minor details, nothing. <laughs> I mean... So he received a call from, from his ex-wife telling him that they are they are onto us, they are killing us. And I don't you know what the... you brought into our life, but they're killing us. 
and now they're going for him in his cell. But he's got a plan. You gotta walk through a window and get to a friend. <laughs> he's, he's going to implicate as well. Oh, Penny's having buffering issues. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> He's convincing his friend to boost him out of jail. Well, it's not jail, it's prison. No, the other way around. Now, yes, again, yeah. I want to point out something odd about Hackman's uniform. Is he has a special forces patch, the the uh, sword with the um, lightning through it, but he doesn't have the uh, special forces tab above it. He only has ranger above it, and that's that was kind of weird. And here are the guys trying to convince her that they are in fact police. Yeah, uh, the minute she, <laughs> the, the gloves, because they all have black gloves yeah. on, you yeah. know they're not cops. Mm. And they didn't show a bag. They they didn't show identification. Anything. Like, hey, I'm a cop. <laughs> yeah, right. And she has a bullshit detector. <laughs> she used to be married to Jean Hackman, so. <laughs> yep. Here's the classic garrison cap that my mother called a cunt cap. Yeah, they yeah. run over. You got knocked the fuck out. No, he's dead. Oh, he's dead. <laughs> Freaking dead. <I> know. <laughs> oh, man, this, this poor guy. Yeah, he leaves. He's like, go. You got to go. He says, we got to report this to police. Don't call the police. Go. <laughs> <laughs> These are very dangerous people. It will kill you. <laughs> of course, I, I, I like to um, riff on films and I'll pause it while we're watching it and say what I think he should say in a scene. Ooh, I don't know if you can hear that. My cooling system on my computer just turned on. No. Yeah, I can just hear my laptop working really hard. And I don't know why it's turning on because it's not, it's barely warm. Barely. Because I have a cooling system under my um, laptop that plays all the time. It's always going. He's just resting his eyes. Yeah, we watched that scene and Gary goes like, oh, now they have someone to question. I'm like, um, I doubt that. You keep Should killing be. the people we need to ask questions of. <laughs> that was one of the jokes in, in uh, Lethal Weapon that I liked. Even though what uh, Rod says to him, is bullshit because they'll do that I, you know movie writers will do that they'll write that in the script you know wing him we need to ask him it's like you don't wing people you know because that's potentially maiming them and you legally can't do that you're legally not allowed to intentionally maim somebody which is why cops just like soldiers shoot center mass and I still think it's... And they're also stuff. ordered in, in New York's um, city, uh, many major metropolis cities, uh, you have to do what's referred to as a mag dump. Uh, when you fire a weapon, if you fire one round, you've got to fire all of them and do a mag dump. <clears throat> that guys, is a problem. That is a real problem. Yes, it is. It's time for our ad break. 
Yes, is it? it yes, is. It is. All right, we'll pause here. This is the big buffet uh, scene, which, you know, they have some really good food in it. Okay. <laughs> See you after the break. Meet the Seattle Vigilante. Like so many comic heroes, this warrior hides his identity. But his identity isn't the only secret he has to keep. After grievous wounds received during combat, Tier 1 operator John Russell begins to recover and comes to terms with his new reality of being an amputee. And as he learns how to use his new prosthetic limb, he finds himself caught up in the bureaucratic red tape that too many wounded veterans experience, the exhausting med board process. Out of sheer frustration, John takes it out on the criminal scum of the city. But when reality kicks in, John realizes he started something that's having an impact on the greater world around him, and thus has to reevaluate his motives. And moreover, just how far is John willing to go to finish this war he's declared against the criminals in Seattle? And will he even survive? From the creator of IDW's award-winning graphic novel, Code Word Geronimo, comes a new story about a different kind of warrior, Vindicated Inc., the first of its kind disabled veteran action hero comic. The Vindicated Inc. graphic novel crowdfunding campaign on FundMyComic.com is provided in the description of this video. We hope you become a contributor. Please share this link. Thank you. Come on, Bob. Don't eat all the chicken. Uh, I know you want your man reelected, but we can't wait. And there he is again. That actor that nobody ever remembers the name of. He was in a Above the Law with Steven Seagal. He's his uh, CIA contact old friend in the CIA. Uh, you should reveal at the end that they're only using paintballs. <laughs> we did, uh, when paintballing came out, I was in the army, and we are like, holy shit, this is awesome. And we do uh, CQB training with paintballs, and there was this one female in our unit, and she was a dick shooter. She would just hit you right in the dick every single time. Ouch. She was she wasn't very tall. And um we all started wearing cups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that shit hurts, man. My second brother did this for his <clears throat> what's it called in, in English before you marry? You have this one last party. Bachelor party. Yeah, yeah. Um they went painful. Um, shooting and after that we had a family happening and he was bruised all over and said man I didn't expect that shit to hurt yeah. they still had fun yeah I don't think has culture ever been on pop culture mind I think he has because we've been friends for a while no you have been there but I don't think they have been I've been on with him on other channels but I'm not sure if we've ever had him on here I know that um Valiant Renegade's been on our channel. I don't think Country Casino has been on in my time here. So oh, shots now. fired. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> good one, good one, Diva. <laughs> I can't help it. I suffer the Irish curse. I'm peeing. <laughs> This guy right here with the white hair there, he's always playing cops. Made a career out of it. He's from Chicago, so he's always playing Chicago cops. Now, doesn't that look like the exact same apartments from um, uh, the Billy Crystal uh, nah. cop movie, uh, Running Scared? It looks like the same tenements. And there was a certain point where Gene Hackman decided to go for the paychecks. And uh, he'd still do good movies, but 
he stopped worrying about trying to win an Oscar. Because he did some films that he thought he should have been nominated for and won and got snubbed. And he says, right, fuck Hollywood. And I'm going to do this for the money. So he started doing more comedies and more um, action films. That's not a curse. It's just a thing. See you later, D-Bud. All right, D-Bud. See you later, buddy. Yeah, he's a, a wrench over on Midnight's Edge. We always say hi to each other when I jump into a chat over there or on another show. He has no idea he's walked into a neo Yahtzee group. Oh, he he knows. That's that's what the mission is: infiltrate the neo Nazi group. Oh no! I thought I thought you were talking about Hanky. Yeah, he he got the kid. What? Yeah, I'm talking about Gene. And once he gets in there, he's like, "Oh shit." <laughs> and everybody dressed like that. <laughs> like, uh, hey guys, um, Heil Himmler. <laughs> and then, of course, there's his partner or a cop that he knows. Oh, wait, no, it's not him. It's uh, Franz that knows him. That's right. Oh, um, by the way, I forgot to mention one of the of the fake policemen in Germany, that was Vigo the Carpatian, the Carpatian. Yeah, I pointed that out to her, that the guy who is a German cop is Vigo from Ghostbusters 2. He's also the father of the missing boy in uh, the movie um, out of, uh, in the Mouth, Mouth of Madness. Madness. <laughs> Just a bunch of Yahtzee goons. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, the use of government cars in this. The the just the crappy paint jobs of those cars. Yeah. U.S. had some of the shittiest paint jobs on cars back in the seventies, going into the eighties. I don't think that actor was. He was a, a boxer. He was a boxer uh, he, monkey. He has the nose of a boxer. Yeah, but he has, his nose. Also, is damaged from years of cocaine, and uh, it led to. It's why his career in Hollywood ended so abruptly, because he partied and and wouldn't stop doing drugs, and it's why they didn't bring. There's Dennis Franz. That's why they didn't bring him back for doing the voice of Vigo the Carpathian. They ended up just hiring uh, uh, Max von Sydow to do the voice. He was, I mean, if you go read about his life, Monkey, that, that dude, I don't know how he survived as long as he did. Crazy. Got into crime, man. He was a criminal. He was a mess. And this is an early film for Dennis, if not his first film. And Oddly enough, it's the only time I've seen him in shape. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know. Uh, that guy was a fucking Vietnam War vet, combat veteran. He was a real deal. I always liked Dennis what? Franz. I, like, I find it funny, though, that they'll transplant New York accents into Chicago. Yeah, you might and he does... Him. He does a halfway decent job of kind of trying to throw a, a Chicago accent in. 
but they're really funny with their vowels in Chicago and the way they use their R's. It's it really hard so on weird. R's. The bears. Bears. Er, er, they over enunciate. They'll also add sometimes at the end of words a trail off vowel sound that it doesn't exist. So Chicago invented the Valley Girl. Now I will tell you, to with guys like this, they're wearing the uniform, but it is just the costume with these guys. Just one more disguise of who they really are. That's why I don't like them. There he is, the actor I was talking about did start. He played one of the admirals that was taken over by the alien in, in Next Generation, Contagion. And he won't let him. That this is the other thing. They want to kill him, and yeah. Tommy's like, "No. You want me? You need me. No, you don't hurt him, because this is where you understand he actually really did take a shine to Hackman's character." Maybe we don't get the subtitles here. Oh well. And there's the gangster from Home Alone. Keep the change, you that's filthy him. animal. Oh, that's what I remember him. Right. I had the same moment, Monty, when he told me he's like, that's where I know his face from. Yeah, my dad mm. really Look loved Joanna Cassidy. My dad thought she was one of the most gorgeous women. man you just look at that street there right now and i've got a shiver because i've been to chicago a lot of times and that i can tell it's cold as shit that wind comes in off the lakes too and it'll fucking rip you up that cold i feel bad for skinheads when they're out there those actors <laughs> <laughs> They have nothing to warm their heads, man. That's cold as shit out there right now. Good thing you glorified the actors. Yeah, shit's going down. Their goal is to arrest mm -hmm. Hinky, the real Hinky. Because he's there as a cover for what's really happening. And they, they're they thinking that if we get him, we gum up the works. I think. And that's another thing you get used to living in uh, Illinois and Chicago is uh, during winter. Cars all look like shit around the wheel wells and under their bases because it snows so much there. There's just constant dusting on the bottom of cars. Oh, come on. Let me in. Uh, my husband's in there waiting for me. Sorry, ma'am. Hey, wait. 
Hey, wait, what's up, my friend? Details, man. Details. He, uh, oh, uh, whoa, he's gonna pass the next one 1300. There you go. Nice. Outstanding. Congratulations, buddy. Keep going. What I tell people is don't hyper focus on it because it'll stress you out. Don't, yeah, don't do that. It will come. So now Franz goes in there and, and uh, to go question him. Where's my guy? He was picked up with everybody else. Oh, and this comes. is where he runs into this dude. They, of course, know each other. So now he's setting up Franz to get killed. Tells him to go to this place. So they go meet this undercover guy. And then they both end up asking each other, so why did you want to see me? He goes, I didn't ask to see you. I was told you wanted to see me. It's a setup, and we get a shootout. Classic moment. They do take down a lot of bad guys here. Franz and him, but Franz gets nailed during the scene. And the undercover cop gets killed. Yeah, he gets killed. How that many dude. people die in this movie? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just say more people than Tommy Lee Jones' character had deployments. For sure. <clears throat> Let's see oh, don't apologize, beginning. Wade. No, I'm very proud of you, man. But I just don't don't like you. You always feel like you're a little stressed and um, you shouldn't be stressed out about that stuff. That's all I'm saying is don't, don't let it stress you out, man. That stuff will come. Those numbers. Now I will point out that for somebody who is in the military, uh, Gene Hackman's character does a better job of handling a, a fake gun than um, Dennis Franz. Franz yeah. actually does this at one point. I was so sick. And I think he was trying to replicate the way a, a, a pistol kicks and blank when you fire blanks, they don't kick. Uh so he um I think he, he pulled it back and then but when he went to shoot again, he whipped it forward and that's that's bad, bad discipline. You don't do that. I wonder why they okay, didn't but, tell him that. By by my count. At least 14 people are killed in this movie. Like I said, more than than uh, Tommy Lee Jones' character had slashes for deployments. <clears throat> and here's the cool thing. He was a uh, real airborne ranger, by the way, Dennis Franz. Uh, serving in Vietnam, he served with both the 82nd and the 101st. So he got the double A and the fucking Screaming Eagle. Damn. And he is here entering into shock. Hey, Pacific 414. Long time, my friend. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you, buddy. All right, I'm pausing it for a second because I want to show you. There you go. Now, it says 82nd, but he was also with the 101st. So he gets the honor of wearing both patches. 
I'd really like to jump out of perfectly functioning airplane. Yeah, right. Yeah, but he needed it. You know, every paratrooper is a shoot tester. That's all they are. Will it open this time? Mm. <laughs> and Gene Hackman, as I said, was U.S. Marine Corps grunt. He served honorably, but he was, um, he's one of those guys that just, um, didn't excel in the military so this that's why his character really seems like gene hackman yeah there's an article in in a reader's digest called the winning wave i remember this article i read it when i was a teenager that gene hackman did an interview and he talked about the winning wave was his father leaving home and saying goodbye to him for the last time when he was a kid It's a tragic but very uplifting article. If you ever get a chance to find a copy online, it's Gene Hackman, The Winning Wave, Reader's Digest. It's a very good interview. And that's the thing, you know, uh, Keith and I have voracious appetites for this stuff. That's why we have such a weird knowledge of film. I don't think it's weird. It's impressive. Impressively weird. <laughs> yeah, you can put it that way, I guess. Oh. By the way, another uh, veteran actor that a lot of people are unaware that served in the military is James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones served in Korea during the Korean War. He was a lieutenant in the U.S. Army and uh, was discharged in 1955. He served with distinction. Jimi Hendrix was in the military. But Don and I were talking about one day, a lot of people don't know, is that uh, he was sent to, uh, is untreatable problem that required counseling. And what the untreatable condition was, uh, is a chronic masturbator. Oh. True story. That's he was sucks. always fucking jerking off. <laughs> and they, the military frowned on that stuff and saw it as a um, flaw mental flaw and so he got out on a medical discharge what some people call section eight but there is no such thing as section eight yeah this guy come to the roof holding their guns in the open in front of all those windows <laughs> nobody sees anything yeah i know <laughs> oh another one by the way he's still alive still a celebrity mr t he served in the U.S. Army as a military prick. He was an MP. Mr. T was a military police? Yeah, he was a military cop. I didn't know about that. And Drew Carey was a Marine. You didn't know? Mm -mm. Didn't know. Mel Brooks served in the U.S. Army. He served during World War II. He was in, do you believe he's in combat? One of his jobs was repairing um, uh, telephone lines in the military or setting them up. And that was in the combat area. Another Marine was uh, Harvey Keitel. God, man. I miss Gene Hackman making movies. People were talking shit about how old he looks. And I'm like, well, he's fucking in his 90s, dude. Yes. <laughs> Let alone. He looks, he looks very well for the age. I just wish that Mooseport wasn't the movie he retired on. What a terrible film. Yeah. 
Yeah, it sucks when you go out on a bad one. He, uh, another great actor who was uh, in the Marines was uh, George C. Scott. George C. Scott uh, served in the um, uh, Marines as an Arling one of the Arlington Guards for the Marine Corps at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. He also served as a literature instructor, as I recall, in the Marines, helping with continued education with Marines. A couple of other veterans in Hollywood, uh, Paul Newman and uh, Chris Christopherson, both served. Lee Marvin, who served on the Pacific. Steve McQueen. But today, one of my favorite modern celebs, was badass Marine, is uh, Rob Riggle. Funny dude. He's a combat vet. Oh, there's our reporter again. They only apparently have one reporter. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's the one following the story. Um, one person who is in the military, a lot of people would probably never know, was uh, Ice T. Was in the military. What? Yeah, he was with the Twenty Fifth Infantry Division. Wow. Served in Hawaii. Got into a lot of trouble. Even went AWOL at one point. They stole I... like a rug from one of the military offices. Got busted for it. But amazingly, he still got honorably discharged. How? I guess he cleaned up his act and <laughs> finished. Man, uh, that guy has no military bearings at all. No. Then you got um, Humphrey Bogart, classic Navy. He was a Navy. He's a squid. There's a rumor that it was during the Navy during World War One that he got that scar on his lip that gave mm. him his lisp. But there's also uh, those who said that it there's a photo that shows that he had it as a kid too. So there's a debate. Um, Clint Eastwood served. He was a swimming instructor for the U S army. Yeah. Back in the day, a lot of actors served. That's why in the in old war movies, almost every actor is an actual veteran. Yeah. Um, what's his name? That was with Clint Eastwood in uh, Kelly's era. Don Rickles, also a veteran served. He served in the Navy. Another guy. Jimmy Stewart and his best friend, Henry Fonda. Both of them uh, served in World War II. Uh, Fonda served in the Navy and worked with in counterintelligence. He worked a lot with... Uh, the Dutch and French underground. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, Jimmy Stewart was a, a pilot, bomber pilot. Saw a lot of action. He had really bad post-traumatic stress. Oh, man, look how cold that looks. Oh, God damn. Yeah. Okay, and at this point, uh, they, they even know that the bad guys know who they are, where they live, and they are mo mobilizing the, the whole policeman family. Because they oh shit. There's a very, you know, I'm going to point this out. There is a satisfying ending to this film. <laughs> there um, is. He's the, the, the guy with, with his son telling him, don't go into the house, no matter what. And all the medics, but you, you, you cannot discharge yourself. I'm leaving <laughs> because I'm a sitting dog here. Well, 
Ooh, everything's white. You know, you don't have to be a racist jerk. <laughs> really? Just everything in that image right there says cold as shit. Because up there right off the lake, the humidity gives it that biting cold. Yeah, I was surprised when he told me how cold it gets there because I know it's called Windy City, but I didn't know that the cold was so bad. Bruises? What the hell is the kid doing to you, Penny? Do we need to worry? So he's up there, thinks he's going to be one of the uh, shooters. Good old hinky. I'm Walter Hinky. I like that name. That's when Tommy kills him. He says, who are you? And he goes, I'm Walter Hinky. And he's like, oh, I'm Walter Hinky. Oh, shit. <laughs> right. I'm a patsy. Yep, there's Gorbachev. He's Gorbachev-like because they didn't yeah. give him the big old fucking thing on his head. It looked like a child had taken their hand and put it on his head with paint in their hands. It's called a strawberry. Zoe, all my kids had strawberries. My boys had them behind their right ears, both of them. And my daughter got one, it, hers, on her belly. And it looked like Australia, the continent of Australia on her tummy. And I, I would tell Zoe, because like somebody's like, she has a strawberry? I went, yeah. And I would say, Zoe, show him Australia. And she'd pull up her shirt to her belly, show her belly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those cars weren't designed for um, stunts. Clearly <laughs> <laughs> not. Yeah, he looks like Gorbachev. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Very another one that, that served uh, was uh, Chuck Norris. He served in the Air Force during Vietnam. I'm not surprised. He also served in South Korea. I knew about Korea. No, I didn't know about Vietnam. He, he used to fly sabers, right? Uh, Chuck Norris? I don't know if he was yeah. a pilot. I, th I, I think... I think he flew sabers. That little fighter that looks a lot like a MiG. <laughs> um, Morgan Freeman served in the um, Air Force. I knew in the that. 50s. And even though he is the epitome of a country hippie, Willie Nelson served. He was also Air Force. And you know what we call Air Force? Civilians in uniform. One of my favorite actors of all time, Gene Wilder, he served as a uh, combat medic in the U.S. Army in the 1950s. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so either. I never heard that he flew. He would sit in them and they would go wherever he wanted. <laughs> That's how he's doing things. <laughs> Hello, Bush. And I've been yeah, Bush you. sent me a message earlier, and I'm still confused by that message. I hope you respond to my question. Like, I didn't know who you were talking about in your message. If you hadn't read my response back to you, I, I wasn't sure who you were talking about.
Oh, now I see your response. Nope, I see your response. Oh, man, yeah. I thought it read pretty well. Well, when you said something about deployment, uh, you I didn't deploy. So I didn't think you were talking about me. I, I'm like, who are we talking about? That's why I was confused. Well, you were sent away to super to make sure those railroad workers were safe. Say what? Um, you and your guys went to um, make sure the railroad. Workers oh, we, that's not a deployment. We yeah, did temporary he, duty. He that's all I did. That. Temporary yeah. duty doesn't count as a deployment, and so I can't ever claim deployment. I was never deployed. Um, temporary duty is like you go someplace and you come back. It's like vacation. It's a shitty vacation, but it's vacation. <laughs> a shitty vacation in which you get fired upon. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I love this scene where where he's like, "Where are you going? Turn around." The guy turns and starts to pull his weapon out, and he fucking drops him. I love that scene. Very satisfying. I, I saw something here. you mentioned before. You tours. That's what you said. Tours. And I'm like, that can't be about me. I did no tours. A tour is a, a deployment. All I can really say is that I served honorably. And I love doing it, but I left the military to raise a kid while my wife stayed in the military, active duty. And... Um, it screwed, it ended my career that I wanted to have my military career because I was dedicated to a kid more than the military. And I'm almost ashamed to say that, but it's true. I love my boy. Why would you be ashamed of that? Yeah, I don't get it. You should be more dedicated to your kid. Hmm. No, <laughs> I've did yeah I did see on temporary duty, but that wasn't a tour. Hmm. My daughter asked me, "What'd you do during the war, Daddy?" I said, "I made people laugh. <laughs> I was a funny guy. Nothing else. Nothing exciting. All my stories are funny." And yeah, I love this moment because the the bad guys are expecting that shot to happen. And it doesn't. They expect Gorbachev to go down. He doesn't. Glasnost is coming, man. There's nothing you can do about it. And Gene Hackman feels bad that he killed this guy because, you know, it's shooting another soldier. But he's just doing his job. He's ordered to do. I like wearing women's underwear. Not true. <laughs> Not true. The lonely death of Tommy Lee Jones in this movie. Mm -hmm. Killed by the only guy he respects. Yep. Yeah. He's dead. I killed your guy. I'd take your fucking head off. I like that line. <laughs> what operation, Sergeant? And you're like, guys like this get away with so much, but this movie gives you that little happy ending. There's no question. He, My son was a military brat. And he ended up serving in the Air Force. He was um, specifically he he worked on um, 
C one thirties. Oh, I love that. He's a mechanic. He's so done with all the bullshit. She can get back to her life. He can get back to being a cop. And then star in NYPD Blue. And eventually move to Dulles Airport. Now the conspiracy has been revealed. You hit the news wires. He's now a whistleblower. And by doing that, he sealed. Um, there's a German the actor. Of- yeah, he seals the fate of these guys. Uh, sorry, sir. I just needed to check the map. This guy. I just need to stop for a second to check the map. And then turns around and just fucking kills them all. Shoots all. Yeah. You may be right, Bush, but Dallas, you know what happened in Dallas. John McClain happened in Dallas. I have no idea what you're talking about. And Dulles, of course, is named after the former head of the OSS and CIA. Alan Dulles. You didn't know that? Nope. You didn't know that. He's a piece of shit. I got to be honest. You know, he's he's glamorized, but no, he's not a very good person. When you get down to some of the stuff that he was involved with, it's like uh, he was... um, a morally corrupt person. I need that, you dick. Oh, I knew that, <laughs> you dick. <laughs> He's not going to eat Martin. <laughs> Get your spelling correct when you're shouting at us, will you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never, I never make fun of anybody for typos ever because I have so many myself, especially when I'm working quickly or being forced because I'm doing, I'm doing something else with my right hand and typing with I, my left uh, hand. I... Because any, if I, once I say that, that's where the brain goes. Automatically people say, what are you doing with your right hand? Clearly I'm doing fucking artwork. <laughs> Getting messages so, from Gary is funny because either typos because he's typing on his phone with his giant hands or it's um, voice to text that just alters what he wants to say. It's funny. I actually get annoyed when people ask me complicated questions while I'm fucking working. I, it really bugs me and it's like, oh my God, I got to, all I'm thinking is, oh my God, I'm going to do a lot of typing with my left hand here. God damn it. Now, uh, Vic Armstrong, when I was growing up, he called me, he, he had an accent very similar to um, Cleveland Browns. So he called me Gurry. Gurry. And then when we watched uh, New Zoo Review, or I'm sorry, Great Space Coaster, there is a character called Gary Gnu. And the Gnu. Gnu's report. And uh, so he started calling me Gary Gnu. Gurry Gnu. Gurry Gnu. I don't know if we're going to do that today because uh, I got a bunch of stuff I got to get onto. Plus, I need to. Oh my God. I don't even want to think about I got We got a show tonight. Got uh, John Brandenburg coming on uh, Dark Matters radio tonight with Don Ecker. Which you know, Mark Center and I are his co-hosts on the show, and I've got to really work on my questions because I'm t- too often I rely on winging it, 
but it's like I really wanted to hit John Brandenburg with some serious questions to, tonight. So yeah, we're not gonna uh, not gonna be doing an after show. Um, but uh, I guess uh, we still got what fourteen minutes before we go. I guess I can go into some of the um, trivia on this film, behind the scenes stuff. I really do love the film, and I, I love the fact that Gene Hackman always, when he plays a soldier, he, he plays it with honor. As a veteran himself, he respected the military. So let me see if I can find some trivia on here. It had a budget of eighteen million. How much did it make? <laughs> it did not do too well. Uh, oh, gross worldwide, it only made a little over ten and a half million. That's disappointing. It should have done better. You would hope so, but that's why you need to keep budgets on films like this low. It was released August 25th, 1989. Also known as Die Killer Brigade and its German release. It was put out by Orion Pictures. I'm looking to see if there's any trivia, and I'm just not seeing any trivia yet. Well, oh, and IMDb has trivia on the goof section. I think oh, it's up above now. Okay, I see it. Go ahead. The goof section is even larger than the trivia. That's my favorite part. Yeah. Goes. Despite the fact that the story is set in various places around the world, nearly the entire film, including scenes set in Washington and Germany, were filmed in the area uh, director uh, Andrew Davis's hometown of Chicago. After the movie, Tom Lee Jones was considered for the role of hero Frank Horrigan in the film In the Line of Fire, which was also an assassination movie. Uh, however, director Wolfgang Peterson favored Clint Eastwood. Tom Lee Jones and Gene Hackman frequently clashed regarding the filming of the screenplay. Hackman was a more, more is less actor who felt he could convey story elements without vast pages of dialogue by simply acting. As such, many scenes were trimmed, much to the annoyance of Tommy Lee Jones, who felt his role was being sacrificed for Gene Hackman's acting. Uh, Chris Christopherson campaigned hard to get the role of the Airborne Ranger, uh, Thomas Boyette. Uh, one of the three movies that Tommy Lee Jones made with director Andrew Davis, the other two being Under Siege and The Fugitive. Andrew Davis frequently directs movies with high conspiracy themes. Under Siege, The Fugitive, The Package, Above the Law, and Code of Silence with Chuck Norris. All involve official corruption, treason, conspiracy within the film's plots. Gene Hackman was later considered for the role of Samuel Gerard, the fugitive in 1993's uh, film, which would have re reunited him with Harrison Ford or Kevin Costner, who also considered the role. However, he turned it down and the role went to Tommy Lee Jones. And Tommy Lee Jones probably went, fuck you, Gene Hackman. Did you see what Bush just posted? Mm -mm. I will pick one that doesn't deserve to be in that list, and that's Saving Private Ryan. Well, hold on, let me read this one. No, and that's where it made its money. It really did. It, it they always make their money back in video sales. See, that was two of the things that vets had issues with, Gary. It wasn't true to their experience, they shit on the military. Absolutely. And it'll piss me off. I will hate a movie if I think they're laser was it laser team made by rooster teeth, which I refer to as dick mouth or cock mouth. 
um, I didn't like their film because they mocked the military. And I'm like, fuck you guys. Uh, let's see. Moving to the one. Best military film of all time, Black Hawk Down, Crimson Tide, Saving Private Ryan, or or, in, or you're asking me. Black Hawk Down. Of that list? Yeah. Absolutely. Black Hawk Down, followed by Crimson Tide, followed by Saving Private Ryan. I'm not that big a fan of Inglorious Bastards. I like the opening scene. It's a movie all into itself. It's a fantasy. Uh, I've actually considered doing Saving Private Ryan on here. And um, if I do it, I'm going to take some time to really dig into what I love about the film and what I hate about the film. Well, what you like is Dale Dye's work. Yeah. Anything that Dale Dye was involved with in that film, I liked. It's when Steven Spielberg went off on his little tangents that I, I have a problem with the film. Uh, the original story or script had the same story about a political conspiracy, but the entire film was to take place inside an army base. Uh, sort of like that's sort of what you refer to as a, um, a bottle episode. It was supposed to be like Die Hard. Davis was brought on board and liked the story, but decided to expand the scope of the action and set the film across many locations but all shot around Chicago. Boyette Hinky, while dressed as a priest, enters an elevated train stop. As he emerges from the stairs onto the platform above, an announcement is made over the public address system. Listen closely, and the voice on the P is actually Tommy Lee Jones. What? Yeah. Hmm. That's Tommy Lee Jones doing, doing the voiceover. The Christmas present that Walter Hinckley gets the rifle identical to Boyette's assassination weapon, of course, is indeed Austrian. As Hinckley says, it's a Steer Og bullpup with a 5.56 millimeter, which is a terrible weapon. Uh, made by Steer, man liquor. I hate that name, man liquor. Just <laughs> as a teenager, I just hated it. Hold on, it's my doctor. Always during the show. They have awesome timing. Hello? This is the avatar. Yeah, fuck you. Corded calls. I fucking hate them. So, uh, let's see. Many scenes take place in Chicago L train stops. The train line was an important part of the setting in another Andrew Davis movie, uh, which starred Tommy Lee Jones, The Fugitive. It's also featured in the movie um, Code of Silence, the L train. Uh, let's see. The security Gallagher leads in the movie's opening scene has soldiers carrying a Remington 870 uh, Leo 12 gauge, a Mac 10 9mm submachine gun, and an M16A1. Nobody. The shotgun and the M16, yes. The other ones, no. Chicago area native Dennis Franz. Plays a Chicago policeman, according to Franz, one of 28 times he's played a cop. <laughs> <laughs> 28 times, wow. Uh, let's see. Both Gene Hackman and Tommy Jones played villains in movies based on DC Comics superheroes. Gene Hackman was Lex Luthor in Superman, Superman 2, and Superman 5, The Quest for Peace. Tommy Lee Jones was Two-Face in Batman Forever. Um. The Colonel in Captain America. What? Tommy Lee Jones was in. Oh, Captain Oh, that's America. right! In the first one, it, first yeah. event, uh, the first Avenger. Yeah. Uh, Gene Hackman and Joanna Cassidy previously appeared in the film Under Fire, which is a great movie. It's a what a thriller. Uh, the Tiki Bar, where Gene Hackman, Joanna Cassidy, and Dennis France meet up, was a real-life bar and not a set. It was one of the many on-set locations that Andrew Davis used throughout the film. Uh, all three actors, John Hurd, Ralph Foody, that's the guy that's the gangster, and D. Danny Warhol, all appeared in Home Alone. Mm -hmm. 
let's see. Oh, that's kind of neat. The pinball machine that's visible behind Gene Hackman in one of the bar scenes is Williams High Speed from 1986. I've played that machine. Any chance we're doing, and uh, I know it's not a military movie, but uh, Die Hard? We can do it on a Saturday. We won't do it yeah. on a Monday. Uh, a, a lot Saturday of locations. Yeah, a lot of locations seen in the film have been seen in previous films directed by Andrew Davis, such as Code of Silence, Above the Law. Yeah, yeah, definitely Chain Reaction. And I like that film. I don't think it's a great film, but I like the film Chain Reaction. Producers Beverly Com and uh, Toby Haggerty did some uncredited work on the script which was written by John Bishop, who was a former Marine, to give it more depth. Because, like so many military guys, we they tend to write like a sit rep. Uh, I have a writer friend of mine that like kept saying that he wanted to write like Vindicated, and I'm like, I'm not going to let you write Vindicated. And he, you know, and he says, but I'm a really good writer. I'm a better writer than you. And I said, no, you're not. I said, when you write, and this is not just my criticism, this is the criticism dished out by Dale and Julia Dye on one of his scripts that he writes like a sit rep. And I said, you don't put any depth to your characters. It's just a bunch of stuff happening and you're relaying it. It's just, that's not how you write. Director Andrew Davis was excited to have Dennis Franz as part of the cast, especially since his series, because uh, that was where he got his big break was Hill Street Blues had ended earlier that same year, which is when the film began production in 1988, which I told you about. Uh, that If it comes out in 89, it was made in 88. Let's see. On December 2nd, 1942, Enrico Fermi and his team of scientists harnessed the atom and opened the door to new scientific and technological realms mentioned in the movie. Uh... See, the movie Russian Roulette 1975 also features a character named Hinky, who is a pawn in a plot to assassinate a Soviet premier. Also, in Andrew Davis's uh, The Fugitive, he uses the word Hinky, not the name, but the word Hinky, which is pronounced the same way. Uh, when his little buddy that gets, you know, hurts his ear, drums during one scene in the, the second film when they blast their way into a house. And uh, he uses the word hinky in the film to describe something's not right. Yeah. Oh, the, the train station, that's a, the same uh, train station in the... Ah. Oh, my God, Kevin Costner and... Yeah, The Untouchables. Yes. Yeah. I... I saw the stairs and mm, I know this. And by the way, Bush, I'm seeing the picture that you sent me. And no way, Paddon is a B tier movie. Paddon has to be in the top. Yeah. Uh, the fake Walter Hinky, played by Tommy Lee Jones, is revealed to actually be Lieutenant Thomas James Boyette, who is part of a top secret military operation called Operation Sundown which Colonel Whitaker, played by John Hurd, was involved with, as well as Gene Hackman's character, was also involved with that mission. And you discover that through the film. Walter Hinke is supposed to be the patsy of the conspiracy involving Whitaker. He is the character loosely based on, on Lee Harvey Oswald. And you kind of get this idea as you watch the film that the whole scene of him with that, East German woman was all part of a stage thing to make him look like he's um, a troublemaker within the military. So the name of the travel agency used to cover a part of the set set up to frame the real Walter Hinky is called Old World Travel, which also reveals Boyette's location to shoot both the press. That's right. It shows it when he's in the office. You can actually see in the background the image of the location he's going to use to shoot him. The pictures that Gallagher sees in the basement while he's been kidnapped are of the location where the assassination attempt is supposed to take place. 
which was the, at the L Trade Station nearby the hotel where the summit meeting is supposed to take place, which is also uh, what he's talking about at the real estate office. Uh, let's see. What is this? I was only allowed to vote on a couple of movies because the whole panel hadn't seen them. What are we talking about there? Oh, the the movies show that. No, oh, let me see. It's in here. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, the bet bet uh, bet stalking. They did a show of best military movies, and they had a lot of movies. Yeah, because if you talk if you, if you talk to me, that's on my list. All three of those films. Um, I went to see uh, Jarhead with a military vet buddy of mine, and we made fun of it while we were watching it. Going, um, this guy wants to make his Vietnam story, his book, and it got gets turned into a film, and it's about a guy. Nothing happens to, and nothing happens to anybody really in the story. It's just, it's a story about nothing. It's like Seinfeld. <laughs> okay. I just made fun of it. The only interesting character is Jamie Foxx is the the um, senior NCO. He's the best part of that film. Everybody else, Jake Gyllenhaal, all of them were just goofy as fuck. Uh, and then the comments about like Hurt Locker, Jarhead, and Wind Talkers. Absolutely, one hundred percent agree. I hate all three of those movies. Wind Talkers. You had one fucking job was to tell the story about those guys, and you fucked that up. Just fucking dumb. Hurt Locker. The minute he talked back to his, uh, I think he was a senior NCO, but he might have been an officer. Um, that wouldn't have. That scene wouldn't have ended the way it did. That guy would have smoked that fucking loud mouth prick. Uh, the guy's not. He has no military bearing whatsoever. And guys like that don't get promoted. Guys like that don't get awesome deployments. Guys like that get weeded out. They're problem people. They're not team players. You got to be a team player in the military. You got to be able to work with other people. And um, Hurt Locker, as good a film as it is, is a terrible military film. You never never go outside the wire without letting somebody know ever period that is dumb yeah it's like let's see you're in an all volunteer military and you fucking hate it <laughs> christ that was my soldier back in 06 i was told to watch this movie called American Soldier by a friend. And I went and watched that movie and I fucking hated it. It's another war film I fucking hate. I hate it. If it were something that I could physically piss on, I'd piss on it. I fucking hated it. Uh, again, all volunteer military, combat medic. Your job as a combat medic is the morale of the people in your fucking platoon. Not just their health, their physical health, their mental health. And you got to keep, you got to pay attention to what's going on in your fucking platoon, your squad, everything. And this guy is whining in front of other people about being a medic. And I immediately was turned off by that fucking movie. I hated that fucking movie. Shot by Sidney J. Fury, the same guy who made uh, The Entity, which I like that film. I made some other crappy movies. Sidney J. Fury is a fucking idiot. He really a ter terrible filmmaker. He got lucky with with uh, the entity. You will find, though, in the military, you you don't run into a lot of individuals. Um, individuality is frowned upon in the military. Being a team player is really important. Doesn't mean everybody gets along, but when it comes to doing their fucking job, they do their jobs. And people who don't do their jobs get weeded out. Lynn Tucker is a great Navajo language helped win a war, but what a bad movie. I know. 
because they couldn't the japanese couldn't figure out what the fucking navajo were doing what they were saying is great all right oh i didn't realize that we already went to uh, we're over two hours all right oh nobody told me i'm busy oh, doing the show i didn't realize either usually like on shows you know like johnny carson who i i just i idolize he'd have freddie de cordova doing stuff like this wrap it up wrap it up it's exactly what i said about maverick versus top gun uh was what i don't know but i prefer maverick uh what was it exactly that you said maverick didn't have the brotherhood or camaraderie no, it's still a good film. It's a really fun film. It's the best Star Wars film since 1980. And uh, I think it's a better Star Wars film than Return of the Jedi. Uh, but uh, it's it's not as good a military film as Top Gun. But it's a fun film. No, it's absolutely, and they admitted it, by the way, Bush. We didn't know that. They admitted, yeah, we stole the third act of Star Wars. We admit it. Absolutely, they admitted it. And because I've dealt with the, the bloody Air Force versus soldiers, Marines. All I can nah. say about the Air Force, best fucking chow I've ever had. <laughs> I, I I can't. Again, Dennis France, he was a real hardcore airborne ranger in Vietnam. He served this country proudly. Love that guy. So if you never watched him in anything, man, um, NYPD do, Blue is, is the shit, but he was really good because uh, that was where he got his big break was on um, Hill Street Blues, which is, by the way, also one of the films I picked as having, or shows, uh, with uh, great theme songs. One of the best theme songs of all time is Hill Street Blues. Pete Carpenter uh, also is one of the co-writers of the Magnum P.I. thing. It's Franz. I said Franz, didn't I? I don't know. I got so used to you pronouncing names the American way. I didn't even pick it up. You can, No, Franz is another way of saying his name. Now, I, I can also say Franz. Dennis Franz. <laughs> I agree, Martin. It's Franz. No, he put the H in there because... A lot of people pronounce his name as Franz, but I'm one of the people that pronounces it as Franz. Franz. It's a Z in there. I'm putting Franz. I'm saying Franz. You're just not yes. hearing it because I'm back away from the microphone. It's not supposed to be it's soft. Dennis like Franz. It's not an S. It's a Z. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting the Z sound, the Z sound in there. It is in there. It's uh, what I'm trying to tell you. I, I am announcing I do enunciate, but I enunciate the American way. Yeah. So, so the, the wrong way. Uh, there is no right or wrong. There is just what it is. If I said his name, he'd answer. It's just like somebody says my name wrong. I still respond to it. Except for that one time in seventh grade. When Michael, they announced over the intercom, well, Michael Beatty. And Jerry Kissel, please report to the office. And we continued sitting at our table in, in homeroom. Teacher says, uh, you boys have been called to the office. I said, no, we weren't. That's not our names. <laughs> Go to the office. <laughs> <laughs> and that was when we got in school suspension for an entire, that was the day we got uh, for an, the rest of the semester. The fuck did you do? <laughs> um, we made nitroglycerin. Oh, and during the weekend, uh, settling of the building or something caused it to ignite. And it was not very much, about a thimble full. And it was close to a window, uh, shattered the window. It didn't blow it out because it had chicken wire in the glass. There are safety windows. So it shattered it. Uh, it also broke the dust-free chamber plexiglass window and a chunk 
of slate on those lab tables. It shattered <laughs> two layers of oh it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and so we get called to the office, and Mike and I are sitting in the office, and we're like, what do you think is going on? Like mumbling. And you can hear this the, the secretaries, the women, two women that were in the office are like looking at us and like they're talking to themselves. I'm like, they're talking about us, they're looking right at us. And then we hear this noise. <laughs> Can't understand a fucking word, but there's yelling. And it's one person yelling. The other person trying to calm them down. And then finally, uh, we call it in the office. We go in, we walk through the little flappy doors, walked around into the principal's office, Mr. Price's office. And we go in there, and there's only him. And we're like, uh, What? Yes, sir. And he says, Sit down, please. We sit down, and then the door shuts behind us. And we realize the science teacher, Mr. Durham, back is standing. <laughs> He was the one doing all the yelling. <laughs> and I feel bad because we tormented him for two years. And um, we had him in seventh and eighth grade. And we tormented the shit out of him. And this was just sort of the icing on the cake. And he just lost his fucking mind on us. Because they were like, because the principal was like trying to be cool about like, uh, do you know anything? Did you notice when you drove into school today that uh, there was plastic over the windows? Uh, uh, over the science lab, I went. No, <laughs> you know anything that might have happened like over the weekend that would cause a window to break? No. <laughs> and I finally, uh, I kind of narked on Mike. <laughs> I mean, I didn't nark on him so much as it was obvious it was both of us. But Mike was the smarter of the two of us, science wise, and uh, Mike's the one who made it. I just. Oh, get the chemicals. <laughs> and we got in school suspension. We sat in our own room. We had our own lunch. Alone, just the two of us and a teacher. For the rest see, of that semester. You see, the, that is uh, the, the thing that is wrong. You punish. Yeah, in, you punish initiative. Yes, it, it was reckless, but instead of being punished... You should have been directed. Yeah, well, that's kind of what was going on anyway. Because Price liked us. Price liked me in particular. Uh, we got along very well. Um, I didn't like Mr. Blaylock. He was my principal in elementary school, and he became vice principal in high school. And I fucking hated his guts. Um, that's why his name is used as a bad guy and vindicated. The, the SWAT commander, the corrupt SWAT commander's name is Blaylock. And I feel bad about it because, like, um, the librarian, I was close friends with her until she passed away. And um, she loved Blaylock. They had such a good friendship. And she tried to convince me he wasn't such a bad guy. But I'm, like, going, that guy paddled me. And I didn't deserve to get paddled. I did the right thing. And he, he punished me for it. So, but anyway. So we got in-school suspension. And uh, we got over it. And uh, it's a good story. Mike and I tell the story every once in a while how we got <laughs> we got Bush, in school suspension for blowing up a classroom. Bush really wants an after party. <laughs> no, no, no. It's too bad. We got to go. I got to go. I really have shit to do. That's my phone is letting me know I got to go do stuff. So anyway, um, I'll wrap it up here. I will say this, that one of the things that I always felt bad about, because we did torment Mr. Durenbeck, um, he suffered from severe depression, and uh, he committed suicide when I was a oh, teen. Oh, fuck. And I always felt a little bit of guilt over it, because he was a wonderful man. He really was. And what really sucked is because of that, as a Catholic, he was not allowed to be buried where he was supposed to be buried in the Catholic cemetery. He got buried outside the Catholic cemetery. And it's one of the things that always made me frown about with Catholic church. Yeah, I hate that about them. I'm sure we're going to get fucking ganked for that word being used, but uh, I'm talking about something that was real and it had an impact on all of us kids when, when he died. It broke our hearts because he really was a sweetheart. Uh, he had no sense of smell. 
and we set off stink bombs in the class and that's how we learned he had no sense of smell because we all suffered and he didn't smell it <laughs> you deserve that <laughs> Uh, we did a lot of pranks on him, but he's so cool too, because he would, he was one of the two teachers that would let us have a break. If we got our work done. He let's have a break and bring in a record and play a record. And like, uh, I brought in my brand new LP of, uh, Billy Crystal, not Billy Crystal, uh, Billy Joel. Um, I forget the name of that album. Um, it's where he's standing on the cover with, um, the trumpet in his hand i can't remember the name of that album now all of a sudden just brain just broke down but i i love that that album and brought that in it's one of my daughter's favorite albums of billy joel's i played her uh, yeah i raised my daughter right uh shinatsky you're not wrong see the story about gets and flag i suffered from severe depression and am the s word yeah no i get it um and that's why i feel bad because we were just trying to be funny as kids and just doing stupid shit. I don't think we were being funny with the, the nitro. We were just trying to be smarter than we, we really were. I thought it was cool. And, uh, so, but Mike Beatty and, um, Jim Woodward both were more advanced than me in chemistry. I was, I was the biology guy. I knew, I know biology sciences, human sciences and, and, better than them and they excelled in the chemistry so and all three of us were best friends with each other we we're the three amigos so but no um i'm gonna get out of here that's in this so uh everybody have a great day today uh thanks for dropping in and i want to especially thank d bud martin uh, i know he's over working on minutes age right next he's a wrench over there andy morrow zach's Dragon Ruse, Penny, Keto Simple. Uh, it's Courtney's Fellowship of Oddballs. We love Court. Destiny Captain. Deleted Scenes. And a good, our good dear friend, uh, Stephen. Monkey Cheapas. Thanks for coming in, buddy. Real Wade Nation Gaming. Always love seeing you, Wade. Uh, Pacific 414. It's always good to see you. And, of course, my good uh, private chat buddy, Bush McFadden, who, who likes food porn. <laughs> He's a food porn kind of guy. He won you with that one. You like that too. Yeah, we still got 27 people watching this right now uh, up in this corner. You can't you see, know it, but I can see it. You know what's funny? You know what's funny? We have more people watching us on Twitter than on YouTube. Is that where it's coming from? Yes. I really it's think it's a good idea. I'm glad we're doing it. And we, I, I've considered trying to do gaming streams just through Twitter. And uh, because you can go into Twitter studio, Martin. So, but anyway, um, I want to thank all you guys for being here today. It was, I love this movie. Uh, I plan to do an, another Gene Hackman film. I, well, I want to do um, a few Gene Hackman films that are military themed. So, we'll, we'll be doing it down the line because I'm a big Gene Hackman fan. I just love that guy. And again, the interview with him, if you can find a copy of it online or elsewhere, Reader's Digest, The Winning Wave. Great interview with Gene Hackman, man. Oh, read this. Tells his story. He's taunting you. He's taunting oh, you. You always send your food pics to me, man. I love food porn. We're out of here, guys. Have a great week. <laughs>